welcome to the Eat, Stay, Love podcast. Hello, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Wendy Feuchtbeg, and today I'm talking with Bob Mile, founder of Tilting Motorworks. You know, as a motorcycle rider, I'm fascinated by Bob's invention. It's a motorcycle conversion kit that allows, picture this, for a full tilt, full lean without falling over. It just slides right into the curves. And I can tell you, it could have alleviated a lot of anxiety for me when I was first learning to ride my Harley. Um, we talk about Bob's uh, land speed record on the Bonneville Salt Flats and his life as an industry innovator. Bob has a great sense of humor, a great capacity for design thinking, and he's a great storyteller. Please enjoy my conversation with Bob on the Eat, Stay, Love podcast. Now I know that you totally appreciate a story of, of motorcycles and and um, why, uh, how sometimes a two wheeled motorcycle can be a little bit uncomfortable. And so it's uh, opportune that we start this conversation with Bob Mile from Tilting Motorworks, who makes a two wheel conversion for Harleys, Indians, and Hondas to a front wheel two wheel conversion instead of the trike. Right. And you call it the trio. Right. Great. All right. Well, tell me, tell us a little bit about you and your company. Well, decided to build a two-wheel tilting front end for a motorcycle after being a longtime motorcycle nut and a car nut as well. And came up with the idea probably about 15 years ago when I had a BMW sport bike and a Porsche 911. And Which I was faster, the Porsche or the sport bike? Well, that was the challenge of trying to figure out which one I could take around the corners faster. And I used to ride around uh, backcountry roads. I won't say where, but uh, and I knew exactly how fast I could take the Porsche around the corners before I would drift. And then I would take the bike around the same corners and kind of try to match my speeds. And I realized my Porsche had a bit of an advantage over the stock motorcycle because I could brake harder into the corners and I wasn't so worried about sliding out the front end because on a stock motorcycle with a single front wheel, if you lose traction with that one wheel, the bike can slide out. And so are you going down on a knee? Like, oh, are you I'm, I'm cornering going, on yeah, a knee? Yeah, okay. I'm going way around the corners okay. on these things. And um, <laughs> so, so I thought about it. I thought, has anybody ever built a motorcycle with two front wheels? Because under heavy braking, whether it's a motorcycle or a car, 70, 80% of your weight transfers to the front of the vehicle. And I thought, wow, if I could put another wheel on the front of a motorcycle, I can get this thing to handle really well. And so I started playing around. I started looking around to see if anybody developed anything like that. And, and nobody really had. And I thought a little bit more about it. And and then I think I've shown you, I've built my original, my original, original prototype I built out of some uh, Legos. Uh, I mean, I love that, that story. I mean, anytime you tell somebody that, you know, they created something that now is... In production. In and, production, but they started it using Legos. Is, and I had three boys, and they had a big pile of Lego. And I said, hey, boys, let's build this three-wheeled motorcycle that leans. And they were all in and got me all the parts and found the wheels. And we, we built that. And I thought, you know, I, I think that might work. And I, I can build things and I can design things, but I'm not really much of a fabricator. You don't want to ride or drive anything that I've personally welded. And well, I so, mean, that's really confidence-inspiring. <laughs> right. Well, you got to know what you're good at and what you're not. And so I, I tried to find somebody that could help me build this thing. And I went to found some custom car racers and fabricators and had a difficult time getting anybody to take the project on, and then finally went up to uh, Western Washington University, and they have a vehicle design program up right. there. And they build Formula SAE cars, as for engineering kind of nerdy racing. And I thought, well, this would be perfect. Uh, you know, I'd sponsor a student team. I would pay for all the materials and mentor the team, and cool. they'd help build this car. And I went to talk to the uh, head of the program, and he was a very nice gentleman and been involved in the automotive industry for years and years. And he kindly told me that actually this had been tried before and had been proven unstable. And uh, so I, I won't let my students take it on for a project because it won't work. Yeah, oh, gosh. And so, you know, it was like, well, that's probably about all the encouragement I needed, you know. Tell me something that I 
can't build it. I am going to build oh, this so darn you're thing. Oh, um, so if you tell me no, I'm yeah. going to show you yeah, that I'll, I can? I'll, nice, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll build this darn thing. And so finally I found this uh, guy who specialized in building rock crawler trucks. These big, What's a rock crawler truck? These four by four trucks that go up side of mountains up over big boulders and oh, super yeah, high like, articulation in the, the suspension. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so he was the first guy that I spoke to that could kind of envision what I wanted to build. And so the very first prototype we built was on a little Honda 250 Rebel. Uh, and I built it on this little Rebel for two reasons. The first reason was is that, well, I'd been told the idea wouldn't work. And so I wasn't sure how much money I wanted to throw at this. And so I could buy the little Honda for $1,000. And I was going to literally take a sawzall to it and cut it up and weld on it. And in your be- in your basement? Well, in at this guy's shed. shop, he was going okay. to do that all for me. And and I realized, you know, if it didn't work, I could throw it into a dumpster and, oh, well, I gave it a try. And uh, so the first prototype we built, there's not a single drawing that exists for it because we were just kind of cutting and welding and trying things out and seeing if it would work. But you're and, a mechanical engineer, but, so you right. can kind of visualize oh, and yeah, you kind of was, be able yeah, to... Yeah, we were drawing it all out okay. on, you know, basically literally almost back of envelope sort of things. Okay. And this is what I wanted to do. And I needed a specialized uh, tire that... Uh, or a wheel that didn't exist. I needed a front motorcycle wheel with an offset to it. They don't make them. And so we had to make our own wheel. And what we used was an old 1980s vintage Honda wheel. And we cut out the inner part of it and then literally machined down a dually truck tire rim <laughs> to bolt on and riveted it to this rim. And and the darn thing worked. And so the first run, and the other thing was I wanted I wanted to use as many parts as I could off of other vehicles. So I kind of referred to it as my bits of vehicle kind of because like it's made of bits of this and bits, of, bits that. of that. Bits of this. So my front hubs were off of a Honda 400 EX quad. One of my main pivot po- pivot uh, points on the front that everything was leaning on was off. It was an old uh, axle from a 1947 Jeep. And part of my steering assembly was actually the headstock off of a Schwinn bicycle. And so would the, you like find this stuff like oh yeah. just like, like through pick and pull or oh yeah. like through or, friends? Or stuff or, we had okay, around the shop okay. or, oh, I got this old bicycle. We're looking for this. Pit. Yeah, let's cut that off. Yeah, the 47 Jeep axle was something he had in the back and everything was like that. And, and, and the other thing is I, at the time it wasn't a business. I actually had my own medical equipment business that I owned and operated for 20 years. And this was something It wasn't a, a business idea. It was just something I could do. So why not? And um, so I was kind of building this cool vehicle for myself. And the other thing I was playing around with concept in high performance vehicles is that you always want to lower the center of gravity as much as possible. And so what we did was I figured there's three heavy things on a motorcycle. There's your rider, the fuel, and the engine. And so I decided to, I couldn't lower the engine any further, but I decided to lower the fuel by extending the rear swing arm about two feet and then putting the fuel cell underneath my seat, which I also lowered by about a foot. And the, you need to lower the center of gravity so it hugs the road? Right, okay. yeah. For, for high-performance vehicles, it's always about keeping that center of gravity okay. low. Okay. And uh, so that's that's what this first swing is. So this first one I built, I sit really low into it, and my feet almost go straight forward. And there's no adjustments or anything. So it was built, I'm about six foot two, so it's just built for me. So if I get somebody a little shorter legs on there, they literally can't okay. ride this thing. And, uh, but that's all right. I built it for myself. It was just fun. Uh, but the first test on the bike, getting it out on the road was, um, for people who understand motorcycling, is that a motorcycle steering is different than anything else. So it's like a bicycle, and uh, it actually what calls counter steers. So if you go into a corner and you want to take a right-hand turn, you actually have to turn your handlebar slightly to the left. And this vehicle, when I first tested it, that was my first test. I literally took my hands off the handlebars, slightly pressed my handlebar off to the left, and I bike dove to the right. So it was actually a two-wheel front end that counter steered. And I was just absolutely thrilled. Um, part of the problem with that one vehicle, though, was that uh, I didn't have the suspension system figured out. And I modeled that off an old early 1900s vintage Morgan, an old British three-wheeler. 
And what we use for our springs or our shocks for that were actually Chevy valve springs. And so the suspension just really sucked on this first vehicle. <laughs> um, but it, I just needed to prove out this concept that it worked. And, and it did. And uh, so, but I had modified this vehicle so much, I actually had to take it down to the state patrol to get it oh, relicensed right. and inspected. And so I come rolling in on this machine that, and it this was of this and bits of that. Right. This was before anything like the Canem Spider or anything else had been out on the road. And so they were looking at it, scratching their heads. I had done all my homework and knew the rules and regulations. I was stretching it on a few points, which I won't discuss, but <laughs> it it was all there. And so they, they actually signed off on it. And then one of the one of the uh, state patrol guys, real nice guy, kind of took me aside and he goes, You know what? we really don't want to see guys like you. And I go, that's all right. I really don't want to be here. Tell me what I need to do. Yeah. And he was the one that kind of pointed me on the direction that the business went to is that he told me that motorcycles are classified as having two or three wheels. He said, adding the third wheel isn't why you're here. He said, you're here because you cut the frame. He said, as long as you don't cut, weld, or drill under the frame, we don't care. And so now, so the next bike I decided to build, uh, I made it so it was complete bolt-on accessory. Okay, that's how that got. And so it doesn't make it a WATV, or does it? Or an all-terrain vehicle. It, it maintains a motorcycle status. Yeah, it's just still a motorcycle. Okay, okay. And so you haven't changed any of the licensing res requirements. Technically, the rider, actually, in the state of Washington, has to have a three-wheel endorsement. Oh, okay. And... I've talked with the state of Washington about that and have my thoughts on that. But anyway, you <laughs> legally do okay. have to have that. Okay. okay. Um, so then I decided to build, well, the other reason I built it on a little Honda 250 Rebel is that I kind of have a personal problem, if you will, that I will ride any vehicle to whatever limits it actually has. And I figured with a little Honda 250, I could only get into so much trouble. Oh. Um and actually, there's a couple of funny stories about that. But anyway, I still was able to get in trouble on that little 250. How uh, did you rebel. get in trouble? Uh, a couple times. One, I, I realized painfully it's not always good to use whatever components you have sitting around the shop. Oh, you mean like a bits of this, a bits of that? And, uh, okay. and we were using these rod ends that actually held the wheels onto the bike. Did they stay on? And about it. <laughs> 45 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour one sheared off oh god dude and i the one of the the right wheel completely uh, curled up oh. and dropped the frame off to the right but because i had one other wheel still on the road i was able to steer it did off like, the side of the road did you like corner it like yeah just take it, it just up? kind of you know it just kind of drug the frame on the ground and i was able to come to a stop oh but not after i clipped a, a road sign and but, uh, but you were okay. I was fine. Yeah, and I said, okay, next time we're going to build, we're going to use the strongest ones of these rod ends we can find. Uh, another funny story about that was that. So the guy finally came back to me. The guy who was building the bike said, okay, I found them for you. And I go, what do you got? And he goes, well, we got these rod ends that are actually used for the um, propeller adjustment for Chinook helicopters. Okay. These are aircraft grade. Um, you're not going to get anything stronger. And then I go, fine. And then we, we did a special thing to the inside of it, and uh, we needed to put a special sleeve on the inside of it. Okay. And how that was put in there it was a press machined fit. And so he actually dropped them into um, liquid nitrogen to actually shrink them and then put a drill drop of super glue as he dropped it in there and it locked it in place. Well, I had a problem with one of these, and it was it seemed really stiff. It wasn't turning correctly, and it, like, seized up on me. And I'm, I went back to the shop, and it was like going, hey, what's wrong with this? And then uh, so we called the vendor who supplied these and said, hey, we've got one of these rod ends that has seized up on us. You know, you might want to come take a look at it and help us out. And I guess the guy, the, the my machinist was like going, I've never seen this before. This guy was here in, like, half an hour, the vendor. And said, we got to solve this problem right now. And they figured it all out. And it turns because out it, they got a they got a drop of super glue on on the ball. Oh. So they had made a fault. And 
you know, the guy just like totally relaxed and was like, well, what was the big deal? We because appreciate you coming on out. on helicopters. He put them on helicopters <laughs> and he said, if I hadn't been able to find out what the problem was, we were going to have to ground the entire West Coast oh, fleet of Chinook helicopters because of this. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I know. It's oh, like, Bob. Oops, just, just a little, little mix up there on that. Um, and then I had another pivot drop on me in the next but anyway so i don't ride that one around so much anymore so the next one we decided to build real quick since you're you're totally prototyping right and building frankensteining things together with panache and engineering and skill yeah but still um taking something that is you know uh without protection really and then being able to do it and and being able to laugh about some of this is, is is pretty funny that you live to tell the tale, yeah. Yeah, I know. What was it? the other one on that? The, I got one more fun story on that. Yeah, first do one. tell, do tell. Yeah. So I'm riding along. I'm I'm on uh, Smoky Point Boulevard, pulling in right about where uh, Cycle Barn is. I'm going to pull onto Smoky Point. How convenient! And, <laughs> and I come to a stop, and I hear this tunk, and I'm sitting there going, "What was that?" And I kind of look over. And my main, I have two main pivots. There's a bottom pivot that was that axle. And then the other one was the top was actually the steering head off the original motorcycle had completely sheared off. (laughs) And so I had absolutely no steering. I'm sitting there at the intersection. I'm going, oh crap, I can't move this because the whole front has just flopped over on me. I had no control on it. As I'm kind of thinking about, well, what am I going to do here? There's a person turning off a smoky point in front of me, and I don't know if they weren't watching or something, but they get T-boned right right in front of me. And so the car is moving sideways right towards me. I'm standing on the motorcycle going like, oh. Oh, and it's like shit. one of those slow oh motion sort of things as this car is kind of pushing right towards oh me. And it ends up like about, you know, five feet away from me. And, it and was, he does a jump over <laughs> it. And then <laughs> no. and there's a guy in a truck behind me and he's sitting going, wow, man, that was close. And I said, I'm going, yeah. He goes, and I go, can you help me move this bike off the side <laughs> of the road there? And so I've got this bike. It's flopped over on the side. The, the police are there just right away and uh, because there's this accident. And so I'm not part of it or anything, but I got this bike. I'm by myself on the side of the road. And it's like, could have been five minutes. And then my machinist comes by with a truck and goes, I heard you were in an accident. I'm going, how did you hear? It's like been five minutes. He goes, oh, I was just down the street. And somebody said, hey, I think I saw one of your bikes in an accident. Oh, my gosh. And so the that. guy, you got a couple fire guys helped lift the bike into the back of his truck and off we rode so we, we beefed up that component too <laughs> yeah everything has a lesson but, but i'd proved out the concept and i'd taken it to where it actually ended up uh this kind of a nice tie-in for snohomish because that's where the business idea started is uh, snohomish is quite famous for their annual motorcycle show that's and it just ride in and so I was thinking, ah, somebody might be interested in this. It's kind of a cool, different vehicle. And so I, I rode it to the show and parked it on the side of the road, just like everybody else does. And I was going to go look at all the cool motorcycles. Well, I started taking off my gear, my jacket, my helmet, and everything like that. And uh, before I get all that gear off, somebody comes on over and starts, hey, that's really cool, you know, da 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 And then somebody else, and then somebody else, are you selling those things? And... Uh, and finally, I realized I'd ended up standing next to the bike for like six hours straight, just answering nonstop questions awesome. about this thing. And I'm sitting there going, hey, you know, I might have a business here. Well, the thing about what I like about it, as a new writer myself, um, not only that the idea of safety, it's improved safety, but still high performance. You still got to be cool. It, it has that full tilt lean. All right. Right. And so... Um, I think that, that it's innovative instead of having the trike where you have to like do the slow turn and it's badass looking. I mean, there is a badass factor well, that, to it. And in the performance, the thing that really kind of pushed me to pursue it was, you know, I kind of go back to the original idea. You know, I had my Porsche and my uh, sport bike. Well, I took this thing around those same corners. And uh, in one of my corners that I could take at 55 miles an hour before I would drift the Porsche, I could take that little Honda 250 Rebel at 50. 
So I was actually only five miles an hour slower than my 911. And I'm sitting there going, okay, this is something really worth pursuing. And, uh, oh, and just because it's just kind of who I am, I did take the bike back up to Western Washington University. Oh, and just kind of show the professor uh, up there who said, yeah, that this couldn't be done. And I said, hey, I've got something you might be interested in seeing. Oh, yeah, I remember talking to you. And it had been about two years. And, uh, but he remembered, and uh, actually he was so impressed. There was actually two engineering classes in session at the time, and he actually went in, interrupted the classes, and brought the whole student bot, nice. you know, the classes out to see this really cool machine out in the parking lot. Um, but I was after that performance aspect on it. I mentioned earlier that the suspension system really sucked on this. And, but I realized if I was going to actually pursue it as a business, I actually had to figure out the design on the suspension. And it literally took me about a year and a half of just tinkering around and, and so thinking about it. so did you do the tinkering? Did you reach mm-hmm. out to other engineers, designers? I mm-hmm. mean, or was it all it in was, Bob's head? Yeah, it was pretty much in my head and what I would draw and kind of maybe make a little rough prototype or something like that. So I have all the original copper i i actually built my original one out of copper and i just took copper the legos tubing. are no longer yeah <laughs> i i moved on the, I, I graduated to copper and i actually called it my copper chopper and i still have that in the shop nice. hanging uh, as my kind of but that kind of got me the idea on the the suspension and um and and i also went ahead and pursued my first patent uh on the leaning front end and so that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you because, you know, I know you have multiple patents. Right. And I knew that you were in medical devices and, or, and medical before. So I mm-hmm. wasn't sure, was this your first patent or had were you already a patent holder with your other? Right. No, this was actually my first patent. So what was I, it like I, when you finally got a it was, patent? It was pretty cool. It you is know? pretty cool, yeah. right? And uh, for something, yeah, being able to design and take an idea and actually make it a reality. And so what was the first, you have so many, so what, was it actually the suspension or the tilt? I mean. It was the alignment of the geometry with the hubs within okay. the yeah, wheels. Okay. And so what is the process of getting a patent? I mean, was it as simple as just submitting it? I mean, did it take a really long time? Well, it takes a very okay. long time to get I know. a patent. What Years. is your best advice for getting a patent? <laughs> Well, the important thing about a patent is to remember is that uh, to you can get one, I guess, for a vanity because uh, it's never going to work, and you can just pat yourself on the back that you've got this patent. Hmm. But a patent does not stop anybody else from making your idea. It actually only gives you the right to sue them if they do. And so that's something to remember as well because you can get a patent, but it's doesn't give you any protection. It just gives you the right to go after somebody for monetary damages if they try to make it. Okay. Um, but it is a laborious and an expensive process. Yeah. So what's the next step? So you've got your suspension, you're patented, and then you've got all of this interest. Well, the next one then I had, to, I had the idea on the, the suspension, so I actually had to build that one. Ah. So I decided to build my next prototype. And going back to the original guys that said, you just need to make it a bolt-on conversion, uh, that's what I did. So I decided to up my horsepower a little bit, and I went, my little Honda 250 Rebel had about 25 horsepower. I then graduated and bought a Yamaha VMAX that has about 1,200 cc's and about 120 horsepower, and would do 0 to 60 in under 3 seconds. And I thought, that's the machine for me. And uh, so we went ahead and, and built the next uh, generation design on that. And by that time, I was working with a full-on professional machine shop. Mm-hmm. And we were, would design that first one all in a CAD computer-aided design programming package and did all the machine work on CNC mills and nice. such like that. And actually... That, that was a fun one to build. Yeah. And But that one was a nerve-wracking one, and that the first test ride I did on that, the thing just handled like crap. And I thought, In what way? oh, years of work on this, and there's something wrong. I, I We had some things that were over-tightening, 
tightened. Oh, okay. And uh, who so was once it? you loosened everything up, then everything, it was did everything then, that you wanted it to yeah, do. But it was then just it, that initial yeah, ride. Yeah, yeah. The initial ride was like going, oh no, what do I do? <laughs> I spent two years on this thing, and the thing doesn't work. Um, but uh, we we ended up getting that one all up and going, and that actually proved out the the suspension concept that I could do it. And then I could really build a performance vehicle on this. And along the way, I ended up solving just a bunch of different problems that motorcycles have, one, one being under really heavy braking. So I'd improve the braking on the motorcycle because you now you had twice the rubber on the road uh, oh. in the front. But a motorcycle, one of the disadvantages is that with a single front wheel, how it's designed with the fork design is that under heavy braking, the bike will want to dive on its nose. Right. Whereas I no longer have front forks because I remove those when I build my kits and the bike now, my two wheel tilting front end just sinks down under really heavy braking, which leaves more weight on your rear tire, which makes your rear brake more effective. Um, so I was able to improve on that. Um, and then, so that, that Yamaha VMAX, that was, a, that was a really fun motorcycle to ride and it was quite a monster. And, um, uh, so when did you know that you wanted to make it for Harley? Okay, so is that the is that the that's your second one? Now right. we have to go to the third, which was actually built on a Harley Road King, and uh, decided to do that after going to all these motorcycle shows. And so many of the people were asking us, "When are you going to build it on a real bike?" <laughs> and mostly those were the Harley Davidson right. owners. And I, up to that point, had owned pretty much everything else but a Harley Davidson. I'd owned Yamaha, Suzuki's, Honda's, BMW's, everything, uh, but a Harley. So I actually bought my first Harley and put about a hundred miles on it and then took it apart. And just drove uh, it home and yeah. then immediately just yeah, like, just like yeah, my guys in my shop were like going, you, because no. it was a beautiful <laughs> black road King, which was uh yeah, beautiful, beautiful bike. And you uh, bought a new one. No, I bought oh, it okay. used from a guy say. who was actually a Harley Davidson, uh, rep and it was his okay it was his little garage queen he oh, never okay. never actually rode it i put anyway but it was a very very nice, nice bike um but basically we just took the ideas that we had learned on the v max and then kind of gradually improved everything the steering geometry the components that we were building and uh totally designed that more for production and that's the first one that we started designing in our SolidWorks, the 3D CAD yeah. programming package. And about this time we were building the one on the Harley, I had found out that um, down in Bonneville, uh, where they do the land speed racing, somebody, they'd open up a new class for three-wheeled motorcycles. And somebody had set the land speed record down there at 120 miles an hour on a Harley Davidson. And I'm thinking with my machinist, I'm thinking, Mike, come on. My VMAX can beat that. Let's just take that VMAX as it is down there, and we're going to go beat a land speed record. You want to do it? Yeah. It's like going, yeah, let's do that. And, of course, it was a little bit more of what we had to do to get the bike uh, prepped for the racing down there. Uh, but we did. We we went down there. and Okay, uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. So you go down there. Oh, first of all, describe what, what it looks like. Is there a lot of people down there? Is it oh, just, yeah. a, okay, thousands? Is uh, it, uh, I don't know if there's a thousand, but there's hundreds and hundreds down there. Because and it's only one day that you get a chance to set it's a, they, records? They, they, it's or a, about a week. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. about a week. But right. there's a lot of things that go on. And it's just like this massive pop-up village in the middle of this salt lake bed okay and uh teams from all around the world come for that one week to okay. go ahead and race there okay and so we showed up you know we we're kind of one of the lower budget kind of groups down there but uh everybody really fun racing environment uh people helping each other out with tools and nice. expertise I how do that. i go faster I and yeah. stuff like that and uh so we went down there and uh i'd never done anything like that before uh, had my full on, had to buy a leather one piece racing suit. And it's real hot. Oh, down now I'm there. intrigued. <laughs> yeah. But it's real hot down there. And like you're just, a, and you can't take this, you, you just, yeah. So it's yeah, in the 90s and you're wearing a, this leather suit and it's like hot. Um, but we go down there and it was just like, never have done this before. I thought, okay, I'm going to go. We're going to do a 100 mile run pass, you know, and, uh, 
and do a shakedown run, see how this thing runs. And so hmm. you have to go a hundred miles? No, no, no. It's it's a only it's a five mile oh, track. Oh, five miles. Yeah. So okay, you start from a stop and you start building. You shift through your gears through miles zero through one, oh. and then uh, between mile one and two, you're kind of gaining speed, and then it's actually a timed mile between mile two and three. And then between three and four, you start slowing down. And between four and five, you're off the track. Oh, okay. So you're starting from a standstill, and then you just kind of keep jamming through the gears okay. until you hit okay. that mile marker two. And then that's when they start uh, the clocking on you. And, uh, boy, everything was – I hit 100 miles an hour pretty quick. You can on that VMAX, and everything was feeling really good. So I kind of stayed on the throttle. And uh, my first pass I did was at 125 miles an hour. So on my very first pass down at Bonneville, I set a land speed record. So, uh, you <laughs> How act- you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you actually, and then within two hours, you actually have to turn around and then do a run in the opposite direction. And then what they do is they average the two runs to give oh, you okay. your speed. Um, so that year we actually, uh, finally ended up at about 132 miles an hour was the top speed we could get. That's all you can do, Bob. That's all you can do. Well, the problem was the bike was a shaft drive. Oh, and you the shaft. Yeah. We got the shaft <laughs> got on the that shaft. one and you, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't get it go any faster. That's as fast as the bike could go. Um, I was at 9,500 RPM in uh, fifth gear and couldn't go any faster. So we decided to go back the next year. We wanted to go faster. You know, we know this thing could go. The, there wasn't any problem with the front end. And uh, so decided to go back the next year. We had actually hooked on a Yamaha Venture rear end, which is a touring bike, higher gearing. Yeah. And so I am I know the routine now. I'm doing about 130 miles an hour, but now I'm in fourth gear. Oh. And I'm sitting there going, awesome. I've got a whole other gear here. So I shift up into fifth gear. Not enough. Not enough speed, uh, not enough power in the engine to climb into that oh, fifth gear. God. Oh, that sucks. And so I'm sitting there right around that 132 mile an hour range, and I'm sitting there going, man. And then I, we happened to pit really close to Triumph had decided to come down and set a land speed record with a trike that they built, their Rocket 3. So I'm producing maybe 120, 130 horsepower. So I kind of go over to their pit. Kind of like, hey, hey, what's going on here? What do you got built here? And I said, yeah, we got this Triumph 3, and we got this thing tuned up to about 200 horsepower. And I'm sitting there going, oh, man, you know, we're, we're smoke. We're going <laughs> to lose our land speed record here. These guys are going to beat us. Well, it turns out that the fastest they could get their bike, and so you have to see, like, the, 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 the total image down there. So Triumph is down there. They have this full 18-wheeler down there with their own machine shop inside and tools and lifts. Yeah. yeah. And all their engineers are wearing like these little white lab coats and everything like that. And you got me and Mike, you know. <laughs> He's this ponytailed Harley guy. And, and, and we, we have the, uh, you know, the Craftsman tools at the back of my Sequoia with 300,000 miles on it. And uh, so we're sitting there thinking everything, but turns out they could only go 133 miles an hour on their bike. So they were faster than my old one, but I'm sitting there. I, so I start going down to all the pit crews. I'm sitting there going, I just need a couple miles an hour more. What, what can we do? And one guy was going, well, what are you running in your tire pressure? And I'm sitting there going about 40, 42. And he goes, bump it up to 60. Rock hard tires. Keep you f- f- higher on the, on the salt. The other one's going, well, what are you doing with your brake pads? And I'm going, I'm not doing anything with the brake pads. He goes, just before you take off, have one of your crew put a screwdriver up there and press the pad off of the disc. That'll add a little, it'll give you about another mile an hour. Well, we start doing all this thing. Then finally this one guy is going, well, what kind of fuel are you using? I'm sitting there going, well, just high, you know, high grade unleaded. And he's sitting there going, kind of looks around. He goes, hey, I got some stuff in the back here. You got know, some nitro. <laughs> some 50 bucks. And I'm sitting there going, all right, <laughs> I'm poured on in, <laughs> okay. and uh, so we poured it on in, and uh, ended up going 134 miles an hour. <laughs> so we actually beat the uh, the full factory uh, Triumph team, and then for the final I'm one, I'm buying you a lab coat for Christmas. <laughs> so so the final one, so we decided to go back. So we realized we had a power problem. We decided to go back because we were determined. We knew this thing could go really fast, and so realized we had a power problem. So uh, one of my other buddies that I got to be friends with over the last couple of years. He said, hey, yeah, I've got a special, I've got an extra nitrous system. You just hook that up, right? 
And so I go, okay, we'll fire this puppy up. And uh, so I, I did the plumbing on the nitrous system and trying to figure out where do I put the switch to turn on this nitrous system. You know, I'm doing 130 before I need the nitrous. Because almost flat too, aren't right. you? Right, yeah. And I'm, you're lying down right. and stuff and you're trying to, where do I, there's not like I can reach up and hit a switch and stuff. So I said, you know what? I don't really need my horn at 130 miles an hour down in Bonneville at all. So I actually wired my nitrous system to my horn switch on my left handlebar. So you can just have it right So I there. just hit it, nice. right. So then I go, okay, I'm back down there. I'm doing 130 miles an hour, fourth gear. Okay, I know the routine here. I hit fifth gear, hit the nitrous. The thing pulls like a freight train up to about 145 miles an hour. <laughs> a beast. And, uh, <laughs> and then I lose all my power. <laughs> and... Uh, Long story short, I ended up uh, burning a couple holes in my pistons at about 145 miles an hour and uh, got back to the pits and was feeling sorry for myself. And I was like, going, yeah, well, that's racing. Have you gone back since? No, no, I haven't <laughs> gone back since. But I do have the next bike in mind that I'm going to do. But uh, what are you that's do? it's uh, Harley Davidson makes a bike called a V Rod. Yes. And they made a limited production series in the early 2000s called a V Rod Destroyer that was made specifically for uh, drag racing. And those, a couple of those bikes have been converted on over to run at Bonneville. So that'll be my next one. That's exciting. Yeah. What's the time so, frame? A couple of years? No, I could probably do it next year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we'll I'm see. Be looking for that. Yeah. So with business, um, so now oh. when you went into pr now, right? So then after we had that Harley Davidson, uh, then that's when that's when the business interest really started to take off, and um, the it was the Harley riders that uh, really supported you. Yeah, that really supported and said, "Yeah, oh, I'd love to have one of those on there." And then finally, I had this guy with a Goldwing, a Honda Goldwing, and uh, he was sitting there going, "I want one on this bike so bad." And um, so I said, well, we're, we're not doing them for Goldwings. We're just doing them for the harley Davidson." He said, you know what? I'm going to ride my motorcycle down there. I'm going to park it in your shop, and you're going to have to look at that bike every day you're down there until you do it. And so he just left the bike with me for probably six, nine months. And I just sat there. He's, he'd come by periodically. So he started it yet? And I'm sitting there going, not yet. Uh, but then we, then we finally built one up for the Honda Goldwing. Oh, that's cool. And, um, but, uh, yeah, we started selling them. Uh, quite a bit. The the thing then that really made the business take off, so I built this front end, and you just take a stock motorcycle, remove the front fork and front wheel, and our two-wheel front end just bolts right into place. So I originally going back to, you know, building it for the performance and additional safety aspect on it, and uh, but this, uh, how shall we say, this aging motorcycle demographic uh, kept coming to me and saying, well, can the machine be self-supporting when it comes to a stop? Because they were buying these regular trikes uh, with the two fixed rear wheels. Right. And I said, well, I didn't design it for that, but let me work on it. And so uh, I went through, again, several iterations of designs on how I could actually have the bike lock up when it comes to a stop and settled on a hydraulic control system it has two hydraulic cylinders on either side of the center line of the bike that as the bike goes around the corners, it just exchanges fluid back and forth. And then as you slow down and come to a stop, I have a computer control that line locks the fluid flow and then locks the bike up. Then I ran into the problem was, well, what if the bike's slightly leaned over? So what we did is we added to the circuit board an accelerometer chip that measures whether the bike's perpendicular to the horizon or not. If it's not, it activates a hydraulic pump and motor automatically it and automatically self-levels the bike. And it's all speed controlled so that as soon as you hit that throttle, the lock releases and it just handles like a regular bike. And then if you slow down and come down to about seven miles an hour, the system will relock. And then it's, it's cool. just all fully you automated. you describing to me like an aging motorcycle and your knees are, you know, are just holding up the weight of a right, bike. Yeah. And this takes that right. all away. You can right. easily, it just stays up. Right. And so that's, you know. But again, I, I designed it for myself. And I, I just recently sold off one of my two-wheel BMW bikes because I just wasn't riding it. I actually like riding it for the performance and fun of right. it. And and but, we and we always talked about how, how I knew that this configuration would be a, a safer motorcycle. 
And recently now, because we have had so many of these out on the road, uh, several of my customers have been getting back to me and they've been in accidents on, on the bikes. Uh, one customer recently called me and said, yeah, this saved my son's bacon. Yeah. Uh, I was right. He was riding the bike down the road and a deer jumped over a railing and nailed him right in the headlight. And he said, because he had the two wheels in the front, he was able to bring it to a safe stop. And so you've probably heard about motorcyclists having deer strikes. If you have just a single front wheel, that deer is going to knock that wheel off to the side and the bike's going to go down. Right. Whereas this guy was able to come to a straight stop. Yeah, I, I was going over the pass and a black bear crossed my path, but I had just enough time to slow down and it slithered. But I, I'd always had that, like, what if I had just been right 40 feet more, I would have... Yeah, right. I would have gone down. But this guy, he was absolutely thrilled. Jeez. And another customer came in, really nice guy, Don. He lives out in Montana, and he periodically shows up because he has a daughter living close by. And uh, he came walking in the shop and was like, hey, Don, how's it going? He goes, great. I go, how's the bike? He goes, oh, I totaled. Oh. And I'm saying, going, well, what happened? Well, it was a big Harley Ultra that has a big uh, Harley Ultra, has a big tour pack, the big trunk on the back of the bike. And he was coming to a stop, and he was doing about 25 miles an hour, and a truck rear-ended him at about 25 miles an hour. Totally knocked the tour pack into the back of the seat, into the passenger seat, and then crushed his rear fender on top of his rear tire. But because he had the front end that locked into place, he was actually able to take the bike to a straight oh, stop. Goodness. And his his daughter actually posted up on our uh, Facebook page, you know, thank you for saving my father's oh, life, my because otherwise that bike would have keeled over um another customer i mean it's crazy these things happen it was yeah. so, so many uh was in a roundabout and got t-boned and pushed the bike into the center of the roundabout and he was able to roll off of the bike but because he had the triangle of protection around him he was able to lift the bike up and ride away he said if i hadn't had that tilting motor works uh, it would have crushed my leg, God, and I've got God. I've got other stories about yeah. these customers riding these things, and actually, you know, literally they attribute it to, to saving their lives. That must make you feel really good. Yeah, it's actually you know it's a you know non yeah it's just really cool to to have yeah. these customers. That, so what's in the, what's in the next year and in, in the future for you? Well, right now uh, what we're doing is uh, we're expanding our dealer network, and so now you can buy these uh, machines pretty much all over the United States. We have two dealers in Europe now, one down in South America and one over in Asia, and we just trained our first dealer up into Canada. And so there's literally the bikes all over the world. We're going to be going out to uh, Beijing in about a week to go to a grand opening. Uh, and they will have eight of our motorcycles there. Oh, that's so exciting. So, well, Bob Meal, uh, Mile, oh. <laughs> Bob Mile, thank you so much for being on the Eat Stay Love podcast. Okay. I'm so grateful and I'm so excited about what you're doing. And I love what you're doing for Snohomish and for motorcycle riders and right. for motorcycle safety. Um, we can, where can we find you? We can find you at Tilting Motorworks. TiltingMotorworks.com. And you and have a then, YouTube channel too, uh, right? Yeah, just look up Tilting Motorworks and also a Facebook page. Great. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. All right. All thank right. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, I want to go ride my motorcycle now. And will you ever look at um, Legos the same way again? Uh, probably not. All right, be sure to check out the Eat, Stay, Love, Snow Cold blog to see pictures and behind the scenes at www.eatstaylovesnowco.com and for a link to Tilting Motorworks. Special thanks to Dan Cardenas from Baker Built Works for the AV and technical expertise. And remember to subscribe to hear more great conversations from the awesome people of this community. Hey, thanks for listening. Peace. Till next time. Thank <laughs> you.